Well, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Michelle Margolis is an assistant professor of political science at the University of Pennsylvania. And she holds a PhD from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, a master's degree from the London School of Economics, and a bachelor's degree from the University of California, Berkeley. Her research uh, is on public opinion and political behavior and religion and politics within the United States. And has, her work has been supported uh, by the National Science Foundation and then published in a, a variety of journals, including the American Journal of Political Science, Electoral Studies, the Journal of Experimental Social Psychology, uh, the Journal of Politics, Political Behavior, and Public Opinion Quarterly. And her book, uh, published in 2018, is called From Politics to the Pews, How Partisanship and the Political Environment Shape Religious Identity. I'm sure you'll all run out and order it on Amazon as soon as we're done. Actually, we, we invited uh, Professor Margolis to come today in part because we thought that the topic uh, that she addresses in the book uh, about the relationship between partisan identity and religious identity would be of particular interest on a campus of students that have pretty strong religious identity. Uh, so uh, I think you'll find it engaging and interesting. And without further ado, uh, we'll turn it over to Dr. Margolis. Hi, it is such an honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, I'm supposed to be staying in front of the microphone. I am generally a wandering lecturer. So if I wander, if you know, you can like wave me back over and I'll remind myself that I need to come back here. Um, I'm gonna keep track of time because I, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to get through everything. So I wanna make sure we leave time for Q&A. But yeah, so the title of my book, From Politics to the Pews, How Partisanship and the Political Environment Shape Religious Identity. Um, I'm very excited to be talking about it, especially among a group of individuals like you who actually in some respects may identify very strongly with what I'm gonna be arguing, but it might actually be very different from your own experiences. So I'm very much looking forward to, to hearing your reactions. So I wanna start off by just talking about the public opinion literature when it comes to religion and politics. So public opinion literature in political science has largely focused on how social identities, that can be gender, race, class, how that shapes um, political views and preferences. And one of the key drivers, one of these key identities is religion. And so these are titles of two books that are very prominently, um, that are very important in the discipline. And they have a key finding, which is that religiosity, that is how devout one is and how closely connected someone is to their faith community, affects their partisanship and vote choice. This is sometimes referred to as the God gap in kind of journalistic terms, right? The idea that more religious people are more likely to be Republican and their less religious or more secular counterparts are more likely to be Democrats. So that we have this gap, not just between Protestants and Catholics, but within Protestantism and Catholicism, that the more religious you are, the more likely you are to be a Republican. And looking at the political landscape, a common narrative about why that emerges comes out. So we all know who this is. This is Ronald Reagan. He was one of the first presidential candidates to really reach out to religious voters of all faiths and to try to create an umbrella coalition of religious Americans. And in the 35 plus years since he first ran for office, the Republican Party has become increasingly skilled at reaching out to religious voters. So they do this by championing issues that religious voters care about, whether that's abortion, same-sex marriage, prayer in public school, now religious liberty issues, uh, using religious rhetoric. I mean, I guess the current Republican president aside, Republican politicians in general are very well adept at using religious rhetoric, right, to reach out to faith-based voters and talking about their faith in a way that resonates with faith-based voters, and also that the Republican Party has actually closely aligned itself with religious organizations. So given that political landscape, we should not be too surprised that the argument is that religious people have moved into the Republican Party and their less religious counterparts have become Democrats. So this is kind of a key feature. This is the starting point of the religion politics literature where my book takes off from. And so what I'm hoping to convince you of today is that there's two pieces of conventional wisdom that are not quite right. They're not wrong, but they're incomplete. So what do we as political scientists often assume? We assume that religion and religiosity are fixed. That means that they're stable over the course of your life. If you are religious as a child, you'll be religious as a teenager, you'll be religious as an adult, and that that doesn't change. And the second is that religiosity affects your politics. So what I'm hoping to convince you of in the next 35 minutes or so 
is that religiosity is in fact changeable, that is not stable over the course of our entire lives, and that politics is one of the things that can have an effect. It's not the only thing that can affect your religiosity, but I'm a political scientist, so that's the thing I'm gonna be arguing today. <coughs> this is what I'm gonna be talking about today. I'm gonna present first a theory about when and why we might expect partisanship to affect your religion. We don't expect it to affect you all the time at all points in your life. And then hopefully I'll get through three pieces of evidence discussing, showing evidence in support of this. And then I'll wrap up with conclusions and implications. But that point number four about gay marriage might have to, you might have to buy the book depending on how timing goes. Okay, so the theory starts off by, with the assumption that I don't think politics affects religion for everyone at all times. That is not what I am arguing. What I wanna do, do is find a theory that says, when might we expect politics to exert influence on your religious decisions? And to do that, I'm gonna draw on two otherwise separate strands of literature. The one is sociology of religion, and the other one is political socialization, both of which have long distinct histories, and so I'm going to go over both of them in two minutes flat, so you know, buckle up. This is gonna be like an entire you know, couple weeks of, of class prep in, in two minutes. So the one thing to take away from religious, the religious socialization literature is that religious involvement is dynamic. It is not stable over the course of your life. When you're a child, you are socialized into religion. You don't really have much agency over whether you go to church or you, whether you go to Sunday school, right? You do what your parents do. Adolescence and young adulthood is naturally a time where many people fall away from religion. And there are a lot of reasons why that happens. I should say not everyone falls away from religion during this time. But sociologists have noted that this is the time it's most likely going to happen. And they've noted that this happens across the board, that no one religious faith is immune to it. We see this among Catholics, Jews, evangelical Protestants, mainline Protestants, and there's even research showing that Mormonism disaffiliation rates are highest during this time period. Importantly, not everyone's leaving religion because they're anti-religious or hostile toward religion. It's just not that important to them at that time. And when they become an adult, which I call here adulthood one, this is often marked as getting married and having kids because now you're at a point where you have to decide, hey, how do I wanna raise my children, right? And this is the juncture where I, you might return to religion, right? It says on here, return or not to religion because not everyone chooses to come back, but this is the time when you're making critical decisions. Do I want my child to be baptized? Do I want my child to go to Sunday school? Do I want us to all be celebrating these holidays together? Once you've made that decision, then religious identity is more stable over the course of your adult life. It doesn't mean that it can't change. Things like divorce, death in the family, a sickness, there are lots of things that can happen that push and pull you in and out of religion. But adulthood too, once you've made that religious decision, we see much more stability over longer periods of time. That you don't see 60 year olds just dropping out of religion after being in religion their whole life. That's, that's not something that we see frequently. Okay, so that was a lot of stuff in two minutes and now we're gonna switch gears completely and talk about politics. So the political socialization literature is really interested in how we develop our partisan identities and how we develop a sense of who we are in the political sphere. So children we know have pretty unstable party IDs. They don't really have much of an, a concept of what their, their political outlooks are. But it's during adolescence that our partisan identity really starts to crystallize. And that happens through a number of ways. It can happen from our parents, right? We are no longer in the world in which we think of partisanship as a hereditary trait, that your parents are Democrats or you are a Democrat, or your parents are Republicans, you're a Republican. But your parents' partisan identification can have a big impact on your partisan identity, particularly if the, if the two parents have the same party ID, if they are politically active, if they discuss politics in the home, these are all going to increase the transmission rates that you are probably going to adopt that partisan outlook. There's also the external environment, right? So this is where we think about generational effects, that people who are socialized, say, during the Vietnam War, look very different than people who were socialized during 9-11. Uh, that people at a young age are being affected by these kind of large scale events that are shaping the world in which we live. So people who were kind of raised in the 60s, uh, flower power, anti-Vietnam, to this day are still more liberal than the people who were raised before or after them, right? So how, what their external influences were has, has an effect as well. 
And finally, this is just the time period where you start paying attention to politics at all, right? This is just when you're seeing elections and learning where the partisan, where the partisan divides are and you're sort of sorting yourself out. And once you reach young adulthood, and particularly once you're in adulthood, your partisanship is largely crystallized and stable. So there's great political science research that shows we actually don't see much variation in your party ID, even over long stretches of time. Right? It becomes a stable, strong identity that not only predicts how you vote, but also predicts how you see the world. Right? So right now, with a Republican president, Democrats see the economy as doing worse than Republicans. It was the exact opposite when Obama was president. Right? How you view the world around you is a function of the partisan glasses that you wear. Right? There's also now the idea of affective polarization, that people want to associate with other people of the same party. You want to marry someone who shares your political views, right? Um, you want to be friends with people. You want to have neighbor. You want your neighbors to be. You want your social life to be in a world where you're hearing one set of political voices or one set of from the same side of the aisle. So your party ID is a strong, stable identity that's largely developed in young adulthood. It doesn't mean that everyone in this room whose party ID it doesn't mean you can't change over time. But if I knew your party ID today when you were graduating from BYU. I would probably be comfortable guessing what your party ID was gonna be in 10 years. I might not be right all the time, but odds are I would I'd probably be safe taking that bet. So what happens when we put these two theories together? Well, what happens is you can see the step, I'm not gonna wander, you can see the step over here, that when people reach adulthood, they're married, they have children, they need to pick and choose, they need to make religious decisions and we know from the sociology literature that lots of things can affect your religious decision at this point, so it's not just about politics, but at this time, they're picking and choosing religious decisions to comport with pre-existing identities and beliefs. You don't want to adopt a religious practice or belief that doesn't coincide with a pre-existing attitude, right? And what's one of these attitudes or identities? It's your partisanship. Your partisanship has already been crystallized, so it's during this window, which I call kind of children at home, right, school-aged children. These are the people for whom I think that religion is particularly malleable, that partisanship can influence these religious decisions. Once your religious identity is stable, then we're not gonna expect as much influence. If anything, we might expect the relationship to go in the other way, because now, at this point, maybe your religious identity is, is stronger, right, um, possibly. But it's during this window window is when we would expect to see partisanship influencing these, these decisions. So, and so I think of people with children at home, their religious identities are still a little bit in flux. They're figuring out where they fit into the religious world around them, but they've already made that political decision. <coughs> so the empirical way I test this in my book is in, in particular, I guess there's two parts, is we're testing the life cycle theory. But we're also testing, we live in a very specific political cultural environment, which is that the Republican Party is linked with religious organizations, religious values, religious beliefs, and the Democratic Party is not so. Importantly, you'll hear me, I'm not saying that the Democratic Party is linked with secular beliefs necessarily, because it's actually not, right? Very few Democrats, there are no, there are very few openly atheist or agnostic Democrats elected to office. They, as a general rule, still try to reach out to religious voters. So when I, the, the reason why I'm focusing on the Republican Party is that it's not an asymmetry, right? The Democrats are definitely the less religious party, but as a party, they're not actively seeking out secular support in the same way that Republicans are actively seeking out religious support. So the empirical strategy is twofold. One is to test whether this close relationship between religion and politics that we currently have in the US, whether that affects partisans' levels of religiosities, and we're gonna test the socialization theory, which is that we have different expectations about how that relationship works based on where you are in your life. That certain people are gonna be more responsive to these differences than others. So the scope conditions. Scope conditions means the limits of what I can say, right? This is about the US, right? All my data are about the US. And your socialization theory might apply very differently outside the US. You shouldn't expect the religion and political socialization theory would be the same. And this is particularly a relationship that's pronounced among white Americans, right? So African Americans are traditionally both highly democratic and also highly religious, and I have a chapter in my book that, that discusses them. But it's most pronounced among white Americans, and then empirically, the data I have can most generally speak to 
mainline Protestants, evangelical Protestants, and Catholics. So kind of other numerical minority groups, including LDS, we can only speculate about. I don't actually have data to bring to bear on this question. So the first piece of evidence, I'm going to go, I went into the lab, or I guess in this case it was the internet, so a theoretical lab, um, to see what happens, basically what happens, I can't, in an ideal world, right, a great way to think about research is if you had a magic wand and you can control the world around you, what would you do to get the data you wanted? Right, if what I could do, I would randomly assign whether everyone in this room is a Democrat or Republican, and then I would follow you over the course of the rest of your life. That is obviously not possible. As much as wishing would make it so, it is not possible. So what do I do in the lab? I actually prime people, I just encourage them, I remind some people, hey, by the way, remember that you're a Republican. Remember that you're a Democrat. So I'm creating the identities to be more salient, your partisan identity. And I'll tell you a little bit more about how I do this. So in the first, I, this was a two-wave study, so in the first wave I collected your partisanship, so I knew whether you were a Democrat or a Republican. And then a couple weeks later, you were randomly assigned to rate some very benign flyers. So this is, this is if you were a Democrat. And you can see you can come, this was actually a modified version of something my mother-in-law, who lives in Ohio, uh, in Rocky River, in fact, <coughs> that this is a modified version of something she had gotten. And you can see that there's no discussion of political issues, there's no discussion of political leaders, there's nothing about social issues, anything that's kind of hot topic. It's just very generally a voter registration drive reminding you, hey, by the way, you're a Democrat, you should you know, remember that bringing it to the top of the head. And they were just rating these flyers in matchups, saying which one do you like more? Which one's more aesthetically pleasing? Which one would make you more likely to go to the event? Demo Republicans saw the Republican version of these. I should say treated Democrats, right? I randomly assigned people to either receive these or they saw similar flyers that were about a recycling drive. So some people, their partisan identities were primed and for some people their partisan identities were not primed, right? Um, and so then afterwards, we transition to attitudinal questions, but my dependent variable that I care about at the end was a religious identification scale, where I basically say, what's your religion? And if you say, I'm a Catholic, say, do you identify strongly or not very strongly as a Catholic? And if you said you're a nothing, I say, do you feel closer to one religion or are you actually really a nothing? And actually, surprisingly, not surprisingly, there's research on this, upwards of 40% of people who say they're nothing, if kind of pushed a little bit, actually feel closer to one religion over another. So you end up with this four-point scale that ranges from strong non-identifiers to strong identifiers. So I want to show you what our expectations are, right? So along the x-axis here, which is the bottom, is control group, right? These are people who saw the environmental flyer. And the treated group, the people who had their partisan identity primed, I'm always going to use red for Republicans, blue for Democrats. Our y-axis here is religious identification, where the more religious you are, the higher you are. So you can see here on the control side, I have the Republican bar above the Democrat bar, right? And that's just what my expectation is, that Republicans are on average more religious than Democrats, so we should see that even in the control condition. But what makes this an example of a null effect is that the treatment has no effect, right? We see horizontal parallel lines. That the gap, this God gap, between the control and the treated is the same. And conversely, this is what an example of a treatment effect we would think would look like. That if I reminded a Republican, hey, by the way, you're a Republican, you might feel more closely to religion afterwards, right? And so you would expect that the treated religious folks would be more religious than the control, sorry, the treated Republicans would report being more religious than the control Republicans, and you would expect the reverse among Democrats. So basically the God gap, I will stop putting quotes around God gap, the God gap we would predict widens because Republicans are moving toward religion and Democrats are moving out, right? So we're gonna start, I have, this is my, my trusty theory slide here on the bottom, which should help us. We're gonna start with people with grown children. These are the people for whom we think religious identity should be stable. So me having you rate some silly flyers that have nothing to do with anything probably isn't going to affect your willingness to say that you are one, how, that your strength of religious identification. And this is what the results look like. The gap actually shrinks a little bit. That is not statistically significant. But it, it doesn't look wholly dissimilar from those flat lines we saw before, that we don't see much evidence that the treatment had any effect. We do see the, the gap between the Republicans and Democrats, but that there's no sort of widening or polarization. 
For people with children at home, these are the people for whom we think religion is changeable, who might be open to religious influence, and this is what the results look like, right? So that among people who have school-aged children, Republicans who were reminded, hey, by the way, you're a Republican, reported that they, their religious identification was stronger than Republicans who didn't, and the converse was true for Democrats. And so to just put this in perspective, this actually doubled the size of the God gap. Right? This is a huge effect on the subset of people. So what, uh, what do I take, what can we and can we not take from this? So importantly, I am not suggesting in any way, shape, or form that I manipulated anyone's level of religious identity in one go. It's about what's salient in the moment and that people want to behave like their prototypical group members, right? But not everyone wants to do that. It has to do with where you are and how strong your religious identity is and how stable it is. And importantly, if I can do this in the lab, we might start to think, if this is happening all the time in the world around us, maybe we'll find evidence that this is in fact happening in real life as well, right? This is one example of a priming experiment, but every time you read the newspaper, and you read about this relationship between religion and politics, for instance, we might expect to see that as an example of priming, right? So the first thing I'm gonna do is to see, does this actually exist in the real world, right? And so this is gonna be my observational evidence. <coughs> One second. So my first set of data comes from a very important part of kind of recent US history, which is the 1960s and 1970s and onwards. So entire books have been written about this time period, so I'm gonna, again, give it very short shrift and <laughs> talk about it in two minutes. But pre the, 19, the late 1960s, early 1970s, the Democrats and Republicans were only really divided along an economic dimension. There wasn't really a moral dimension to be had, right? And it wasn't until first prayer in public school became an issue, and then we had issues. It actually started with the Democrats, not the Republicans. We had George McGovern in 1972, the Democratic nominee for, for president, um, uh, suggesting that abortion should be legal on a national level in 1972, suggesting that drugs should be legalized. It was also the first time that there was a, a sizable number of religious seculars as part of the Democratic Convention delegates, right? So we see Democrats sort of moving away a little bit to the left and becoming more culturally liberal. Conversely, on the right, we start seeing uh, <coughs> we start seeing organizations like the Moral Majority and the Christian Voice, people, the likes of Jerry Falwell, getting involved in American politics for the first time. We didn't have conservative religious leaders taking a national stage. In fact, Jerry Falwell used to say that that was not something he ever would want to do, and that, that he is, his goal is to save souls for Christ and not to implement policy, but clearly that changed over time. Um, and importantly, he was linked specifically among, with Republican parties on the right, right? He was, he was active in searching out, um, he was active in, in supporting Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan, who I also talked about at the beginning, was the first to really capitalize and reach out to religious voters. Importantly, right, before Reagan was Jimmy Carter, the first born again president, also a Democrat. Despite being incredibly devout, he did not talk about his faith. He actually felt very strongly about a separation of church and state and didn't feel comfortable talking about his own religious faith. Ronald Reagan, on the other hand, didn't really attend church, had been divorced on a lot of dimensions, shouldn't have been religious voters' go-to person, but he reached out to them. He spoke about faith. He, he applauded the idea of faith. He wanted faith to be in the public sphere. And so all of these changes, and then I guess the other thing I should note is also, for those of you who don't know, Pre-1970, post Roe v. Wade, 1973, there was a lot of heterogeneity between the parties, meaning that there were Democrats and Republicans who both supported keeping abortion legal at, in the first trimester and not. And even in the party platforms in, the, in 1976, uh, in 1976 and in 1980, both the Democratic and Republican Party's platforms talk about the fact that it's okay to have heterogeneity. The Democrats said, you know, we support, we don't think that Roe v. Wade should be overturned, but we understand people in the Democratic Party who want that and we, and we support that. That is not in the, par the party's platform today, right? It is a strong pro-choice position. Conversely, the Republican platform used to say it was fine to be pro-choice. And then by 1980, that was actually gone. And by 1984, not only was that gone, but it was replaced with particularly religious rhetoric about the right to life. 
So we see these parties diverging. Not only did moral issues not even exist, right? There was no national debate about things like gay rights or abortion in the, in the late 60s, early 70s, but the parties have actually went from being there's pro-choice, pro-life on both sides to a big polarization. So this is the time period in which a lot of scholars point and say, this is when religiosity started affecting politics, right? This is what brought, say, evangelical Christians and Catholics together was this issue of abortion. <coughs> so if that's when people are saying, this is when religiosity is starting to affect politics, that seems like this seems like the place I should start looking, where this is evidence of politics affecting religion. This is this watershed moment. This would be the first place we would find evidence of politics affecting religion in this way. So I'm using the, uh, it's called the Youth pa Parent Socialization Panel. It's this phenomenal data set that interviews, in 1965, a nationally representative sample of high school seniors along with their parents. And between 1965 and 1973, they all leave home. So kind of, they move from kind of their parents' nest to they started college, they are 25 by 1973. Some had gotten married, some had had children, um, but were still very much sorting out where they were in life. And then 1973 to 1982, by 1982, these students were th 35 years old. Most of them were married with kids. So you can think about it as that life cycle image that I showed you before, that these are people traversing this life cycle. But importantly, uh, there was a shift in the political landscape between 1973 and 1982 that I just talked about. All these changes took place at the same time. So if there was gonna be a cohort where we would expect to see politics affecting religion, this would be the first cohort where we would expect to see this. Importantly, the parents were also interviewed. So it's the high school seniors and their parents, which is great because it allows for a lot of control variables. It allows me to take into account a lot of alternative explanations in a statistical sense. And the parent data not only can serve as background information, but it also we can test this, that right again, these are people who already have grown kids. We shouldn't see the political landscape affecting them in the same way as their children, right? So we have two predictions of this. We expect to see politics affecting religion for the kids, but not for the, the parents. So again, our trustee on the y-axis here, we have the trustee, uh, or sorry, on the Bottom here, we have my trustee slide, my trustee theory graph. So between 1965 and 1973, you can see these are just raw averages. It's the percent attending church almost weekly. This is your partisanship in 1965. Again, red is Republican, blue is Democrat. So two things to notice. One, huge drop, just consistent with the sociology literature. These people left home, they became far less religious. Two, there's no difference between Democrats and Republicans. This happened across the board, right? We don't need to really focus on the right. This is just when I do statistical models and control for things, that zero flat line is basically saying once I account for things statistically, that holds, that there's no difference between Democrats and Republicans. All right, but between 1973 and 1982, this is when religion, this is when the political landscape is changing. It's also when we think that these people are in this window where their religiosity is changeable. So here what we see is that both Democrats and Republicans return to religion somewhat, but that slope is much steeper for Republicans. That while there was no church attendance gap between Democrats and Republicans in 1973, by 1982, one had emerged, but it was driven by Republicans re-entering the religious sphere at a higher, at a higher rate, right? So one thing we would wanna consider is, well, okay, so you just showed me politics affects religion, but is it also the fact that maybe religion affected politics? Maybe church attendance in 1973 made you more likely to be a Republican or made you more likely to vote a certain way, right? And these results, you'll just have to trust me, that th these results at the flat lines are basically saying no. Our x-axis here is your church attendance in 1973. Over here, this is party identification and this is vote choice change. And so the fact that they're at zero is saying, your church attendance in 1973 had no bearing on whether you change your partisanship in that period. And I, the reason why I did vote choice is precisely because we had talked about the fact that party identification is very stable. So it says maybe we're not gonna see differences in party identification because people aren't changing, but maybe they'll change their vote. And I similarly see a null result, right? So basically I find no evidence that people's religiosities affected whether or not they identified as a Republican 
or whether they voted for Republicans, but, re but I did find that Republicans became more religious. So by 1982, there's this gap where Republicans are more religious than Democrats that is completely driven by their partisanship, not by their religion. And importantly, this is the results, the raw results on the left, and then using some modeling on the right, among the parents with the control, or sorry, the, the parents with grown children, who we think should have stable party IDs, here we see basically no relationship. These people for whom we think their religious identities are stable, we're not seeing their partisanship having any sort of influence. So I'm not gonna talk about this because we're short on time, but there's a lot of takeaways or a lot of potential alternative explanations that is always present with, with, um, is always present with observational data. <laughs> Rest assured, I address these. One I wanna hone in on is this cohort is a very specific cohort. I'm only talking about one group, right? The graduating class of 1965. These are students who could, could and were drafted in the Vietnam War. It's a very, they're just a very, saying it's a unique cohort is a silly thing to say because every cohort is by definition unique, but we're, we don't know whether this replicates in a different time period. So I'm gonna go into hyperdrive to get through this last piece. Am I okay? Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, we're gonna, we're gonna look at it, we're gonna try to look at this at a, in a different way at a different time period to at least say, does this hold up in another time period? And to do that, I'm gonna look at gay marriage in 2003, 2004. I'm used to presenting to much older audiences who have memories of this, so I will give you a, bit, a little bit of a background. Um, so, gay marriage, super salient issue from November 2003 to November 2004. Started in November 2003, up in the right corner, well, the two top, the two top pictures, the Massachusetts Supreme Court was the first to declare that same-sex marriage would be legal. Julie and Hillary Goodridge, they're the ladies up in white in the top, were the plaintiffs in the case, and so Massachusetts allowed for same-sex marriage in November of 2003. Just a few months later, San Francisco Mayor Gavin Newsom ordered city officials to issue marriage licenses to same-sex couples, despite this being in violation of California Family Code. So this is actually him marrying uh, Del Lyon and Phyllis, I'm drawing a blank on her name, but two prominent lesbian activists. So in response to these two major changes across the, um, across the coast, we have President Bush had a nationally televised address, which he didn't do that many of in, in, this, in this time period, saying that we should be calling for a constitutional amendment to finding marriages being between a man and a woman. In response to this, Republicans reintroduced the federal marriage amendment in the House. It died in the summer of 2004 in the democratically controlled, con in democratically controlled Senate. However, the debate about gay marriage didn't stop there because in November of 2004, 11 states had referendums on their ballots that allowed voters to decide at the state level whether gay marriage would be legal or not, or sorry, specifically to ban gay marriage. There was no legal or not. It was just making it illegal. All 11 states passed. They're marked in orange. And you'll notice they joined the five states in blue. So overnight, it went from there was five states that banned same-sex marriage to an additional 11 states, right? And this is election day 2004. Republicans, very much supportive of these bans. Religious organizations, very much supportive of these bans. Republicans, very much using religious rhetoric to express support of these bans. So what's important about this is that that linkage between religion and politics was made salient basically throughout the entire year, right? And so you can see that picture on the left. It's a polling place, but it's at a church. So you have a true marriage. It's between a male, a female, and God. So this is the kind of emblematic of at the places where you're polling, this is what some of the messaging people were getting. And so the takeaway is that gay marriage was a salient issue that linked religion and politics together. So a, a piece of empirical evidence to this is this is the number of stories in the New York Times and the Washington Post that depicted the Democrats and Republicans as being divided along kind of secular religious lines. And basically, all through the 80s, early 2000s, there's basically fewer than five stories a year. You see this uptick in 2003, and then this giant ballooning in 2004, and then it starts to go back down. Right, so this is telling us that something is going on, that the relationship between religion and politics and the divide with the parties has been made very salient. And so I'm gonna look and see how people responded in that case. 
So I'm going to be using the American National Election Study, which has data. It's, again, panel data, so it's just like the, the previous data. It's following the same individuals over different points in time. So it's collected in 2000 and 2002 and 2004. So between 2000 and 2002, there's no change, right? The, the parties are what they are. Between 2002 and 2004, now the media has made this relationship very salient to us and that this social issue has become very salient, right, throughout the, throughout the year. And my dependent variable here is partisanship. Again, I'm looking, or sorry, my dependent variable is church attendance. Again, looking at partisanship. And again, in this case, I can't follow people over the course of the life cycle, right? People aren't moving between life cycle windows in a four-year period. So much like the priming partisanship experiment, I'm looking at people within the windows, right? So this is the full sample of results. These are just raw averages. I'm not doing any fancy statistical modeling right here. Again, our x-axis is the years. Our y-axis is reported church attendance. The red is Republican, blue is Democrat. Right? So we see between 2000 and 2002 basically flat lines. In the absence of any change in the political environment, Republicans were more religious than Democrats in 2000. They were more religious in 2002, but that gap didn't change. Between 2002 and 2004, it, um, it, did, it did change somewhat. Republicans went up a little. Democrats went down a little. Right? Again, looking first at people with grown, grown children, those whose identities we expect to be stable, we see flat lines across the board, that there was no movement. But for people with children at home, we see this huge gap, a lot of it being from the Democrats. And I'm not going to talk about that, but if someone has questions, I'm happy to discuss the gap. So they went up a little bit for Republicans, but down dramatically for Democrats, right? So that by 2004, among this group, the God gap had increased dramatically, right? And again, I don't find evidence of church attendance predicting your evaluation, your partisanship, your, evalu your vote choice in 2004, your evaluations of President Bush, any of that. It's just that we see it going in, in this one direction. So I'm going to leave this. I am going to come back to the point two, is this cohort unique? So what's important to note is that the cohort that we talked about with the first data, children, they had children and kids at home between 73 and 82, are precisely the older kids the, the ones with grown children in this ANES data. So it's not just, oh, maybe that cohort, their religiosities are just mutable, that their religiosity is always open to influence. No, once they got, had grown children, they actually weren't all that open to influence, right? So we're seeing the results in two different generations, with one, and then one generation moved from being the children, the cohort with children at home to the cohort with grown children, and now they just look like their parents, right, where they're not moving, right? No, it's a terrible thing to say. You're going to end up just looking like your parents, but it's true. It happens to the best of us. Um, and I'm going to leave these alternative explanations for now. <coughs> so <coughs> what I hope I convinced you of in this short period of time is that, one, religiosity cha is changeable, that there's a particular window in your life when your individual's life, when their religiosity is not fixed, and that politics can affect I of religiosity and that individuals are particularly receptive to political cues while in this specific window and that this close relationship between the Republican Party and religion has unintended consequences. And so finally, I just want to say a couple implications, right? So I made these figures in a program so all the windows are evenly spaced. But if you think about the fact that that gray box how long people are on the outskirts of religion for, the longer you're on the outskirts of religion, the more likely you are to develop identities and beliefs that will affect your politics later on. But we know people are spending more time out there, right? We know people are getting married later. We know people are getting more education. We know people are becoming financially independent later. They're having children later. All of these things are keeping people out of religion for longer. And so the longer you're on the outside, the more likely, the more time you have your politics to affect your religion. If we went back to a world in which everyone was just getting married at 16 and moving straight from your parents' house to your married house and you were, had a child by 17, then we would expect this to be a different story. But the longer we're spending in this outskirts part, and we're actually, I was just discussing with Professor Monson today that even in the LDS community, the rates of getting married, you're getting married later, right? Despite the fact that it's still on average younger, than the, than the national average, that everyone and every community is, is staying in these windows for longer, right? <coughs> the second is that our politics of 
our understanding of politics is now going to be different. So this is a, this is a flyer from the 2012 election where you can see that uh, Romney is on the quote unquote right side of various religious issues and Obama's on the wrong side. And so on the one hand, this is telling us something that now Repu the Republican Party has a doubly captive audience. They're not just reaching out to religious voters because they're religious and might be Republican, it's that these Republicans have self-selected into religion itself. So now you have a doubly captive audience of people um, to reach out to. The Democrats, on the other hand, don't have that. Again, because people who are not religious, they're not hostile to religion. They're not all running out and joining atheist and secular humanist organizations, right? Those, the reach of those is minuscule compared to that of organized religion. So whereas the Republican Party has a direct line to its constituency by contacting people basically the, in the days and weeks leading up to an election, Democrats don't have that. Their bases are different and their ability to mobilize and energize are now also going to be very different. And then finally, more generally, <coughs> our understanding of social group influence is just different, right? So a lot of the literature focuses on how, um, how, our, how your strength of identification, you're more likely to adopt group norms, um, and, and behave and act like you're a member of your group. But if your politics is shaping whether or not you are part of that group or how deeply you want to identify with the group, then we shouldn't be too surprised that there's this really strong relationship, right? And so we need to think about whether or not social group influence is nearly as strong as we think it is, or if it's just a function that we're all selecting into these groups because we were already going to do the thing that was asked of us. So with that, I will open it up for questions. Thanks. No, no questions. We probably have time for two or three questions. Okay. Hi. Hi. Uh, Jake Jensen, political science major. Um, so I was just wondering what you, uh, given your theory, what would be some potential, um, some potential implications for uh, campaigns for people who want to target. Uh, use this relationship to target potential voters? Uh, well, if I was a Republican, I would mobilize through churches and just say, these are not only religious people, these are Republicans. And so that would just, that would be, that would be, that's the short answer, I think. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Cameron Bronson, uh, political science major. Um, I guess my question pertains to maybe religion's effort for. Um, making sure people stay. Um, we see um, that a lot more people, especially young people, are identifying as religious nuns, deaffiliating with religions. If a religious organization were wanting to um, s solidify and, and strengthen the religiosity and dedication of members, would you then, given your data, suggest that efforts would be best served, tail um, I, I guess, towards those people in that gap, the, the young adults, rather than necessarily um, strengthening children, just because you, you oh. feel like that's the more vulnerable. Yeah, that's absolutely the more vulnerable. I, th I think that the best thing that churches could do, and I think that they're trying, is to offer non-religious benefits to young people. So kind of the social element, the aspects where you want to go do something. If it's a college campus, it's like you can get free food. It's a good place to, you want a good place to study, like having a good study lounge. Um, I know a lot of the, when I was an undergrad, the various religious organizations would have things that were open till two in the morning during finals and have free snacks, you know, getting people in the door and involved socially because religion and beliefs are just not something that's important to many 20 year olds, they're not necessarily thinking about eternal salvation, right? They're thinking about where can I get some yummy snacks? Where are my friends going to go? What is a cool thing to do on a Saturday night? And so that would be, that would be what I would suggest, which, which I should say seems like what's happening, trying to happen on a lot of college campuses, the free food especially. Yeah. The idea of like going to anything without pizza is, seems, you know, blasphemous. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, my name is Grant Frazier. I'm a freshman. Uh, I guess my question would be with, you know, religion being very closely associated with the Republican Party, 
Do you see that as being one of the factors for why our parties are very polarized today? Do you think that, and what do you think we can do to kind of mend that? Is there anything we can do? I definitely think it gives rise to polarization because, so there's a lot of great political science literature that says the best thing we can do is have cross-cutting conversations. Talk to people who are different from you, right? Where can that happen? Churches, right? You're talking to someone in the pews on Sunday, but if people, if you're now living in a world where your pews are politically homogenous, we're taking away one of the key, you know, the key places where you might get cross-cutting messages are things like in churches or depending on your occupation at your job. Um, but even those are a little bit more siloed um, as far as politics. And so I think it's, I think normatively it's very troubling because you want people talking to each other. That is the way we have mm -hmm. kind of not the political environment that we have today. But and at the very least, if Democrats, they're either not going to church or if they're going to a different kind of church, they're self-selecting into a church that's more liberal. And so you're ending up with these conversations that are happening on a Sunday with a bunch of politically like-minded people. And it's just the same political echo chamber that we bemoan. We say, oh, people only watch MSNBC or only watch Fox News. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing just in the pews. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. And I'm a Mormon Democrat, so talk to me on Sunday. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we have a little presentation. You guys want to bring it up? Yeah, we just want to say thank you again so much to Dr. Margolis for coming. We have some uh, famous BYU fun oh. and uh, a book to read if you're a young family. Oh, so, my uh, God. Anyway, thank you so much. Give her a thank round of applause. Thank you. Again.